Perhaps you have heard the phrase, necessity is the mother of invention. Well, what does that mean? It means we need something, and so we invent it. I can think of several examples. Farmers needed to make their operations more efficient, and so they invented and started using tractors. We use computers and cell phones to make communication and research more efficient. But what existed before computers, phones, and tractors? John 1, verses 1 through 3 state, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Since the beginning, we have communicated through the word, first spoken and then written. Sidney Sheldon writes that a blank piece of paper is God's way of telling us how hard it is to be God, how hard it is to show truth through the written word. Donald Murray states, writing is invention as the author pursues truth through language. The theory of invention, then, attempts to explain how writers get ideas or how theorists and researchers and teachers imagine that speakers and writers get ideas. A key aspect of this theory is the relationship between originality and imitation. How do writers fill up that blank white page or screen, all the while fighting the urge to plagiarize that antibiotic-resistant infection, as Steve Lynn writes. In the classical tradition, writers imitate others. Sir Francis Bacon suggested that discovery is recovery of knowledge that the mind already possesses. Thus, Lynn argues, a broad liberal arts education is crucial so that students have minds already filled with information to rediscover or recover. The mind is like an empty filing cabinet, waiting to be filled with knowledge of a variety of topics. Aristotle discusses 28 common topics that the mind attempts to organize and use to invent arguments and texts. We may invent arguments from opposites, from more or less, or cause and effect. In rhetoric, the goal is to persuade others. To invent persuasive arguments, we organize the thoughts in our minds and use pathos, ethos, and logos. In the classical approach to rhetoric, ideas flourish and grow from a well-stocked mind that may imitate other successful rhetoricians. Just like this gorgeous mum grows and flourishes in the fertile soil and sun, even if it does imitate the process and appearance of a million other burgundy mums. While the classical approach encourages imitation, the modern tradition dictates that students must find their own voices and arguments. During the 1960s and 70s, teachers used specific strategies to help students generate content and discover purpose. The focus shifted to the writing process and what teachers could do to help their students invent new texts, such as free write exercises. These teachers, McRory, Elbow, Murray, Coles, Knoblauch, and others, believed students could discover the truth on their own through writing. The focus is not on correct or incorrect, perfect grammar or following rules established by others. Well, neither approach is perfect. At what point does imitation become plagiarism? What if a student really has no idea what to write or how to write it? And even well-known authors, such as Mark Twain, imitate and transform the texts and ideas of others such as Shakespeare. For example, in The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, the king and duke invent their own performances out of a humorous medley of Shakespearean references. No scholar I've read accuses Twain of plagiarism. Rather than either invention or imitation, Steve Lynn argues for a synthesis. He references Bothius's discovery that the topical systems created by Aristotle and Cicero could be harmonized. He argues that teachers need to draw on both process pedagogy and the classical tradition to give students the flexibility and proficiency to invent. First, we must ensure that our students have full filing cabinets, that is, ideas from which to write. Then, we must teach them how to work the cabinet. 
We give them texts, images, and models to imitate. But we also teach and model the process of inventing new texts and arguments. For example, last year I gave my students the task of inventing and creating a mask to represent themselves. As you can see, students were inspired by a number of shapes and symbols that they synthesized to invent their own unique creation, reflecting their personality, hobbies, and life experiences. The same may be done with the written word, as we provide prompts, models, and texts that inspire our students to invent. After all, in the beginning was the word, and since that time, we continue to draw upon the word.